Ladies and gentlemen, and now please warmly welcome Mr. Andrew McCagg, Portfolio Manager, Japan Strategic Value Group from Nomura Asset Management to tell us more about his topic today. A big round of applause, please. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, as introduced, my name is Andrew McCagg. I am a portfolio manager with the Nomura Japan Strategic Value Strategy, which has been rebranded here as the B Nippon Fund. Before I begin, I would like to thank the organizers of this wonderful investment forum for inviting me back. I was here two years ago for the inaugural event, and I'm glad that I must have said something important or something interesting at least to have been invited back. So thank you very much. Now, as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about Japanese equities once again, but narrowing the focus a little bit to talk about it from the viewpoint of a value investor. Now, you don't need me to tell you that value has struggled over the last several years. If you've been following global markets, uh, there's been a significant headwind that has preferred momentum and defensive plays over the value factor. And that is the same case for Japan. That being said, that doesn't mean there aren't any investment opportunities in Japan to take advantage of. And so today, my goal is to convince you that value investing is still a very viable option. And the Japan Strategic Value, or the B Nippon Fund, uh, can help you identify these opportunities going forward. Now, before I dive into kind of value versus growth, I would like to take a step back and take a recap of the Japanese equity market and where it stands today. As this slide shows, it's been 30 years since the bubble burst in Japan. 30 years. And since that time, if you look at the Topics Index, the numbers at the bottom here, you'll see that the Topics has declined by over 40%, despite the fact that earnings per share and shareholder return has more than doubled over the same period of time. So after 30 years after its peak, Japan remains very much still a market in recovery. Next, let's look at the valuations. Now at the top there, you can see that Japan, the title is Japan is deeply undervalued. And if you compare it to other developed countries and de developed markets, you'll see that by many metrics, Japan is significantly more undervalued. If you look at PER at 13 times, it's equivalent basically to the UK, but much lower than the US and Germany. And if you look at PBR, which is highlighted here in yellow, you'll see that at 1.2 times, Japan is significantly more undervalued than other countries. In fact, Taking a look at the market, roughly half of the listed companies in Japan are trading below book. That's an incredible, incredible statistic. This is a developed country. Why is 50% of the market trading below book? Now, obviously, low ROE levels, Japan is notorious for having companies with low ROE, so that's the main culprit for it. But it's still amazing to me to see that over half the companies in Japan are trading below book. Just another stat to show you that, yes, Japan is, in fact, deeply undervalued. That being said, I mentioned earlier that earnings per share has more than doubled over 30 years. Let's look at other fundamentals. This chart shows the topic's performance over 40 years compared to the book value per share. Now, if you look at the first decade, from 1980 to 1990, the book value per share increases quite steadily, and that supported what the market became the bubble. Since the bubble burst in 1990 to 2000, you can see that the book value per share remained flat and was stagnant. Over that time, you'll see that the Japanese market traded within a relatively narrow range. This is what has become commonly known, at least in Japan, as the lost decade. In 2000, you can see that the book value per share steadily accumulated until the global financial crisis and lost what it had accumulated over that decade. And what was the lost decade became the lost two decades. Since then, in 2010, and with more or less 2012, 2013 after Abenomics, you can see that the book value per share has started to steadily accumulate once again, and the market has reacted positively to this. However, you'll notice that it still hasn't been able to beat that ceiling that's been created in 1990. So while Japan's fundamentals are improving, we saw that with the EPS, now we see this with the BPS, it's remained unrewarded in the market. So it's natural to ask, well, why is this the case? What needs to change in order for these fundamentals to be reflected in the market price? My answer to you is improved corporate governance and shareholder return. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Andrew, wait. You've been talking about corporate governance and shareholder return for four or five years now. What's the big deal? What's taking so long? And yes, on the surface, if you look at this chart on the left, if you look at dividends and share buybacks, they are increasing. 
So on the surface, it looks like it's already improving, and yet those fundamentals have yet to be priced in. That's not the right answer. But if you scratch below the surface, on this right-hand side, you'll see that historical retained earnings are also still increasing and reaching historical highs. That means companies are still hoarding cash at historic levels. So if you compare the level of share buybacks and dividends of the shareholder return overall compared to the earnings, the percentage-wise, it hasn't increased that much yet. So while we've started to see some improvement, the concept of improving corporate governance and improving shareholder return is very much still in the early stages in Japan. There is one thing I'd like to point to, though, that gives us a little bit a light, of, a light at the end of the tunnel. This chart is the historical announced share buybacks in Japan based on fiscal years, uh, going back to 2014. Last year, in 2018, you'll see that we reached the historical high of an announced share buybacks of about 7 trillion yen. This year, 2019, you can see, we've already had over 5 trillion yen announced. And we're on pace to easily double the historical high that the Japanese corporate set last year. So, perhaps we're at the very precipice of finding out such tangible progress being made in Japan. So, so far, we've seen that Japan's marketing recovery, deeply undervalued, the fundamentals of improving, just unrewarded, and yet perhaps going forward with corporate governance improvement, it may be reflected in the market price going forward. Now let's go back to where I started with regards to value versus growth. This chart compares the PER of vol uh, value stocks versus the PER of growth stocks. It's basically taking the value stocks PER and dividing it by the growth stocks PER. So the lower this chart goes, the more out of favor value becomes. Now, growth has outperformed value in Japan since 2009, so it's been a full decade now. And it's been a struggle, obviously, but we're reaching a point where the dispersion or the spread between value and growth is reaching historical levels we haven't seen since the dot-com bubble or the actual bubble back in 1989. And so, for us, I'm not here telling you that value is going to recover more than growth starting tomorrow. I can't do that. What I can say, the probability of growth continuing to outperform value going forward, historically speaking, is more unlikely than value making a recovery. Now, the value growth factor, this issue is not just in Japan. It's a global issue. Uh, you can see that it started off earlier in Japan. This is a graph going from 2009 to 2019. And comparing the MSCI Japan value versus the growth, you can see the spread at the bottom there is approximately 50%. In the all-country world index, you'll see that the spread is actually over 70%. It's even more prominent on a global scale. That being said, it's just happened way earlier in Japan, so we've been aware of this fact for much, much longer. When, when it becomes this kind of spread, I often get asked, well, maybe there's something systematically different. Maybe the dynamics of the market have changed. Maybe value just won't work anymore. And my answer to that is that's absolutely bull. Excuse my language. If you look at this, this is actually a white paper that uh, we wrote earlier this year looking at the value effect. And we found that, I don't have time to go into it very deeply. If you're interested, please let me know and we'll get you the copy of the white paper. But uh, basically, the result is, despite the headwinds that we saw, the value effect remained intact even after 2010. Now, the way we found this out is what we did was we took the earnings of, the actual earnings of 2018, and said, if you were here in 2016 and able to perfectly accurately predict that earnings, this stock would have been a value stock. And if you go about it that way, you can see that while the impact of the value effect has declined from 16% to 10% over the, between 2001 and 2010 compared to 2011 and 2016, it's still very much alive. Rather, over here on the right-hand side, this is the gray area is what was considered value stocks based on the consensus analyst estimates. So if you were just using sell-side analysts and their forecasts, it was near impossible to outperform the market as a value investor. What you needed was a proprietary research, your own research, that was more accurate than the analyst in order to provide returns in this difficult time. So opportunities to generate returns in value stocks still existed. They were just much, much harder to capture properly. With that in mind, 
I'd like to go into the Japan Strategic Value. Once again, this is the B Nippon Fund and explain how we believe we can identify these opportunities going forward more accurately than, say, just looking at low PBR stocks, low PER stocks, and traditional value metrics. First, just a very brief introduction to the strategy. Um, what we do is we use triangulation of value, which means we're looking at three different types of value and comparing stocks based on undervaluation, but also the potential for that value to increase going forward. Now, again, we're a fundamentally research-driven process. We have six dedicated portfolio managers that conduct our own proprietary research, which is separate from the analyst's estimates, so we're not working with what showed you very poor returns in the previous slide. The strategy has existed since 2000, provided about 4% annualized alpha uh, since the inception in 2000, and again, approximately 16 years of investment experience of the team of six. This is a slide that China goes into our philosophy you see three very famous value investors up top there, and the quotes there are some of the quotes that have helped shape the Japan strategic value philosophy. Uh, but at the top there, I see the paying less for value with potential to accumulate. That's the main goal here. And if you look at the Warren Buffett quote, price is what you pay, value is what you get, that really hits home for us. Value is not just buying cheap stocks. It shouldn't be. It should be buying companies that have an intrinsic value compared to the current price, right? So it's about price is just what you're paying, value is what you're getting. Now, with this in mind, our objective is to create an attractive upside-downside capture, which I will show you in a minute, that compounds over time. And in order to be able to provide that, we need to have an esoteric mindset or unique or original ideas, and we need to be contrarian we can't do what everyone else is doing in order to succeed. Secondly, we need to be focusing on the tangibility, balancing the tangible analysis, and extrapolating allows us to minimize the mistakes and minimize investing into value traps. And then insight-driven, again, studying non-conventional aspects of the value chain, yield lasting insights. This is more to do with things like Recently, over the last year, 2018, end of 2018, you saw a very strong dip in semiconductor stocks. This is because the outlook for memory from smartphones and data centers declined quite heavily, and cyclical stocks declined quite heavily in 2018. That being said, our view on semiconductor-related names is more to do with the demand that should come from automobiles going forward. Now, our argument is, a car is going to become basically a computer on wheels. Okay, it's already doing that. We're seeing more and more ECU chips being included into vehicles, and the value of the automobile is moving from traditional uh, auto component makers to electronic component makers. The second point is, if your smartphone breaks down, for example, if the chip in your smartphone breaks down, sir, you get a new smartphone, right? It's easy. If a chip in your car breaks down, it's a life and death situation. Therefore, we believe that the high-end chip makers will benefit most strongly from the demand coming from the automobiles over the next five to 10 years. That's basically the Japanese area. So last year, when cyclicals declined significantly, we bought heavily into some of these companies. And that's actually proven quite well for us. Uh, going, I know it's not the chart here, but going back to the value growth chart, growth is outperforming value again in Japan by about 10% this year. And yet our strategy as a value strategy has outperformed topics by 2 to 3% year to date. And that's because we're identifying more long-term, non-conventional aspects of the value chain and not just referring to the short-term downturns and the short-term cyclical trends that uh, afflict many value investors. I talked a little bit earlier about the triangulation of value. Basically, that means we're looking at a holistic, taking a holistic approach to three different types of value uh, and value assessment. First, we're looking at asset value, which is relatively self-explanatory, but it's not just looking at the balance sheet. It's looking at reproduction costs, which includes things like distribution channels, branding, how much money you spend on advertising. What does it cost to build this company from the ground up today? That's reproduction cost. Now, asset value, one factor here is that it usually requires a catalyst of some form to unlock this value. So in addition to looking at just the potential value that it has from the assets, we also need to look at the probability that something can come and unlock, unlock this. This can be anything from management change or restructuring of the business. 
So that's the first type of value. The second type of value is earnings power value, which is based on sustainable earnings. Now, please keep in mind, this is not earnings growth. This is what, on a base level, can the company, what's its ability to earn? Okay, on a sustainable level. This also includes things like, uh, we're looking at EPS here, so it also includes shareholder return and whatnot. And it's based on the competitive environment and the trajectory of the different business segments that the company owns. Lastly, we're also looking for franchise value. Now, franchise value is something that comes on top of earnings power value. So any company that we identify that has franchise value will also have earnings power value. The difference here is on top of earnings power value, Franchise values, companies with franchise values also offer a business that has a very large entry, a barrier to entry, excuse me, as well as areas where it can continue to invest to increase its business with a high ROIC. So these are the three types of value that we're searching for. And then we compare that potential with the actual price and undervaluation. And the more undervalued it is, the more potential we see, the higher weight we give it in the portfolio. And with that, this is our investment outcome based on that philosophy and process. Since 2000, this graph, I know it's labeled SVO, that stands for Strategic Value Open, so that's the Binipon Fund, essentially. Uh, you'll see that the middle line is the MSCI Japan value, and the lower line is the topics. And so over time, we've obviously been able to outperform both the overall market and the, MSI, the value index, despite recently having not being able to add on to that excess return due to the global uh, the growth headwinds. If you look at the upside downside capture that I talked about, we're trying to give you more, pay less for value that accumulates, right? If you look at here compared to the topics on the right hand side, you'll see that uh, every time the topics increased 100 basis points, the strategy increased 109 basis points. Every time the topics declined by 100 basis points, our downside capture was at 90, just under 92%. So we've been able to successfully give you the high, attractive upside downside capture since inception. Now I want to take the rest of my time to show you a couple examples. I already gave you a little bit of an example which is coming up, but a couple of the examples of the types of stocks that we're looking for that reflect the asset power, uh, asset value, asset earnings power value, and franchise value. This is Mitsubishi Estate. Now, they're a leading real estate company in Japan, and we believe they have significant, significant asset value. You may be thinking, uh, well, I've read that real estate, land prices should be decreasing in Japan. You have a declining population. Why should we invest in real estate? Well, that's precisely why it's undervalued. The point we see here, though, is Mitsubishi Estate owns very sought-after land right by Tokyo Station. And a majority of their land that they own is in Tokyo. And actually, despite the fact that the population is going to start decreasing over time in Japan, the population in Tokyo is actually still increasing by something like 400,000 people a year. It's still growing. Office vacancies are at all-time lows, but they're remaining there. And office rent is still on the way up. So while many analysts believe that office vacancies will increase and rent will decrease, and which is why this is an undervalued stocks, if you look at the assets that they own, the properties that they own, it's very, very sought after areas, giving it a very high asset value. Second thing with Mitsubishi Estate that we like so much is they're a company that's improving their shareholder returns. This is going back again to the corporate governance and shareholder return. We actually met with the management a few months ago and we saw that they're going to generate about 3.5 billion US dollars worth of cash this year. Compared to that, they have only about 1 billion US dollars worth of developments in their pipeline at least 2.5 billion of free cash flow. What are you going to do with that? Obviously, we implored them to return that to the shareholders. And so far, they've already announced one pretty big buyback this year. We're anticipating more to come. So the potential here is not just asset value, but also potential for them to improve their shareholder return. Next, this is Sumitomo Bakelite. They are an example of earnings power value in our mind. This is an example of a company that is not part of it semiconductor related. So it goes back to the story I was talking about earlier. They're a chemical company. They make sealants that go into semiconductors and into automobiles now as lightweight materials. I already talked to you about the type of potential we're seeing in this company, so I won't go too far into it. But you see the blue line is the performance. The pr 
you can see that it dips significantly here. That's at the end of 2018, which is what I was referring to earlier. And you can see that we've added weight to that since then because we're so confident that the overall long-term robust demand that this company will see has nothing to do with the short-term cyclical downturn in semiconductors. Lastly, this is Xing Ed's chemical. This is one company that we believe has significant franchise value. This is another company that makes uh, semiconductor products. They're a silicone wafer maker, leading global leader in silicone wafers, as well as PVC plastics and other offerings. Now, again, this is the story with the same story with the automobiles and semiconductors being growing and seeing robust demand going forward. But on top of that, Xinhetz Chemical is very unique in the sense that they only build capacity after they've already negotiated a contract with their clients. Essentially, they never have oversupply because everything they make, they sell. And when they sign a new contract with a new client, they build the capacity just for that client. And they have a significantly high ROIC because of this. And they're the global leader in several of these areas which has a high barrier to entry. So they are one company that we have identified as a company with very, very large franchise value. Okay. I think through those examples, I hopefully I've been able to show you that we're a little bit different from just the traditional value management style. Excuse me. And there's a couple things. One, the value growth dispersion has reached historical levels. So we're anticipating value to make a comeback going forward. We've already seen it in September. September, we saw that value outperformed growth by about 2%. And it was similar trend in October until the last week where we saw some correction and growth strong comeback. But on top of that, even if growth is outperforming, our strategy has been able to outperform because we're looking not just at the short-term cycles and more of the long-term. So to summarize what I've talked about today, we saw that Japan is still a recovering market that offers a unique blend of G7-like infrastructure, but emerging market-like structural inefficiencies. That's why you have seen the improved fundamentals not be reflected in the market. And then amidst uncharted waters, this is talking about the value growth. We're at the forefront of the prominent challenges headlined by unprecedented market distortions. With that in mind, this is derived from a quote, or I'm paraphrasing uh, David Swenson, who is the head of the Yale Endowment. In order to deliver unique returns, you need to be uncomfortably esoteric. You need to be contrarian. You need to be original. You need to be unique. You need to be doing something completely different from other people in order to be successful. And Japanese equities alone, the market alone, is already offering something unique. We showed you that 50% of the market is trading below book. That's something that you're not going to find in many developed markets. But on top of that, the Japan Strategic Value, or the Binipon Fund, our team provides a unique insight and unique research, proprietary research, that is able to provide higher returns. So. Can Japanese equities deliver? I believe so. And we believe that the Japan strategic value strategy or the Bini Pon strategy can be here to help you do that. Thank you very much.